Hey everybody, this is Eric Enga of Stone Temple Consulting. Uh, excited to be doing our third virtual keynote today, and we're going to focus on stuff related to mobile. And as part of that, thrilled to have uh, John Mueller and Maria Moeva, uh, two uh, Google Webmaster Trends Analysts, joining us for the first time on uh, a virtual keynote event. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. So, uh, yes, it uh, uh, should be a great event, and I'm uh, very, very excited about it. And as always, uh, Mark Traphagen is with us, so uh, say hi, Mark. Hello, everybody. Good to be with you. Yeah, and uh, Mark is going to be active on YouTube, uh, interacting with you uh, with any questions you have over there in the meantime, uh, and we'll manage and drive the Q&A process when we get there in a little bit. Uh, and our hashtag for today's event is hashtag virtual keynote. Uh, so if you need help spelling that, um, my suggestion is because it would take too long for me to do it now, use Google. It's pretty good at helping you correct uh, uh, words like that. But, uh, but John, you, you had this important announcement you were going to make for us today. Oh, man. You're spoiling it. So I, okay. I, I was going to make a joke about us moving to desktop friendly, but uh, <laughs> actually, I mean, people still are still challenged so much about getting a mobile site out, especially small business owners is something that we've noticed. They, they really have a big problem getting that mobile site out. So I don't really want to joke about it. I think it's still a critical thing to do. So no, no desktop friendly joke today. Uh, OK, well, there you go. I, I, I wanted to see if we could get the audience going there for a minute, but that's all right. Um, so, but as we, we talk about mobile, I mean, I think the data is out there. There's tons of data out there that shows that, that uh, you know, more people are searching on mobile already than on desktop uh, devices. I think that crossover happened in May of last year. I remember when you guys announced it uh, on your blog. But uh, also, uh, Sundar uh, showed, uh, shared some data on uh, the uh, proclivity, if that's the right word, to do more action-oriented queries. What was that data again? Yeah, so we've got a lot of a huge increase in voice queries uh, because as people are using their phone more, a more natural way to interact with it is by speaking what they need. And we are seeing that around 20% of the queries um, on the Google app uh, on phones are now voice queries, as well as out of the voice queries as a total thing, we get about 30 times more action queries by voice than by typing. So there's definitely a shift happening in that direction. It's, it's pretty early days, but I think for the people who are coming online now, and especially the people who never went to desktop and their first online device is the phone, it will be a very natural way to interact. Right. I mean, it seems to me maybe part of that is selection bias, right? If they have an action-oriented query, they're more likely to do it by voice. But, but it is, does still call out this idea that behavior will shift as the modes of input uh, shift. And it's a whole other set of things which we probably won't be able to uh, dissect precisely today as to how you reshape your mobile strategy around that. But it's something to, for people to start thinking about. Um, so we wanted to go through kind of a few different sections. One is talk a little bit about mobile SEO. And I want to spend most time on some things that are sort of the least commonly thought about aspects of that. Um, app indexing. And then AMP. So that sounds like a good agenda. Um, so to start with, um, I, I'd love to just get a definition from, from, from you on how we define mobile friendly, and what, or how does Google define mobile friendly? What does that mean to Google today? John, do you want to take that one, or I can okay. also provide some general <laughs> insights? I, I guess, yeah, I, I guess the, the general idea is that we want the same kind of content available on your desktop site to be available on your mobile site, and also from the functionality point of view, that users shouldn't have any reason to kind of shift to a desktop device 
to, to actually do whatever it is they want to do, which might be learn more about a specific topic, buy something, maybe engage with other people on your site. That's something where essentially your mobile should be equivalent to your desktop. And given how many people are mobile only or mo focused mostly on mobile, that's something that I think shouldn't be something Google should be driving. It should be something that businesses are pushing for themselves. Yeah, we've identified a few very basic things, very easy things, uh, or common sense things, like the font should be large enough for people to read it. The content should be fitting on a small screen. That you need to be able to um, click things with your with your thumbs. So those are those are pretty common sense things we think. Uh, but what John is saying kind of goes beyond that, which is you need to be able to complete whatever action is necessary on the phone. And for that, it requires actually testing it with users. Because even if your fonts are the right size, it might be that it's still confusing. Right, right, and uh, um, I, I mean, it's, this idea is really interesting. Uh, uh, as John said, yes, if I'm on this device, I shouldn't really feel any impetus or need or desire to go to a desktop device because I can get it done here. That I think is actually a really interesting, big picture way to capture sort of a philosophy to your mobile design. And one interesting aspect of that is what most people do today is they design a desktop site and then they implement some software, maybe responsive web design, uh, or create some new templates, and they squish that desktop site down into a mobile site. Do we need to rethink that approach? Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. So I, I think for, for a large part, it really makes sense to kind of start with a mobile site first and then work your way up to kind of a, a filled out desktop site. That's something that I, I see at Google as well. So I'm, I'm not a real designer, but when, when we work together with people who are working on new products, new features for Search Console or whatever, they, they work with mobile mocks. They, they do all the mocks, all the approvals on a mobile layout. So every new feature that kind of comes out is built for mobile. And of course, it kind of scales up and shows maybe some, some different functionalities or different possibilities on desktop. But it's built essentially for mobile device from the start, because that's where we think, in the long run, most of our users will be. Yeah, we really approach this from the user perspective. So the users are overwhelmingly on their phones and will be more and more on their phones. And Whatever type of content you have, you want to make sure that it's available to them where they are. They don't. They shouldn't have to save your URL to look at it later on when they have access to a larger screen. Like they need to be able to get done what they need right there. And usually, it's if it works on the phone, it will actually be lighter and faster on desktop. Um, if you just keep the phone version. But yeah, mobile first is a way to, uh, definitely a smart way to start building these days. And everybody has a phone like that in their pocket. So this disconnect between when I'm going to talk to my developer and what I do on my phone is really interesting to me. Because people somehow don't seem to think to check their own site on their phone uh, when they do that with every other site every day. Right. Yeah, no, it is, it is uh, very interesting. So. Hopefully that'll be a takeaway for some of you that are watching that you really need to. Mobile first really actually means mobile first. <laughs> All right, and start with your design there. So I, I just want to mention one other thing really quickly um, on the, uh, the mobile um, SEO side of things, because I think it's underappreciated by those people who have uh, mobile subdomains. And that this is this notion of the very user agent HTTP header, um, which as I understand it, because ISPs tend to cache pages, you have to give them an instruction to let them know that your page, your that page varies by user agent. You see people, uh, which I'm sorry, just to finish the thought thread, what that does is it tells the ISP that it has to keep a copy in the cache for each user agent it's willing to keep 
so that it will serve the right version of your page based on whether you have a desktop or a smartphone device. Otherwise, you may have implemented a mobile site and people get the wrong version of the page. Did I get that roughly right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's from from our point of view, it's not something that we made up for SEO reasons. It's it's really just a, a technical thing where uh, we kind of like every every network need to be able to recognize that there's actually different content there. So it's it's something where your ISP will be caching the content, some other ISP might be caching the content, and all of that kind of comes together. So. Uh, from a technical point of view, you have to say, well, actually, this content is different depending on this group of people or um, what, whatever. So it's it's not so much an SEO thing, but more a just a general technical network web web development type thing. Well, no, it's a user experience thing, right? Because I, I could I could try to get uh, somebody's website from my phone, and then when I uh, uh, get there. I might get the desktop page because it was cached in an ISP. And very wow. user agent is the way to address that problem to make sure that the user is actually getting the version of the page that you painstakingly de designed to fit their device. Yeah. And, um, it gets but, more complicated with the content itself as well, where if you're doing this for images or if you're doing it for CSS or JavaScript files, then suddenly you have this weird mix of uh, CSS for for the desktop site and the JavaScript for the mobile site, and it just breaks. So that's something that's really hard to kind of debug as as a webmaster. So kind of t either going the responsive web design route where all of the content is the same, or really making sure that you have those very headers set everywhere. That's kind of what we'd recommend there. Right. So if you're on a mobile subdomain, the the very user agent uh, header is a really important thing to uh, make sure it's part of your mix. Um, so um, we also heard that uh, page speed was going to become a ranking factor in the next mobile update. Um, can, can you share any of your thoughts on that? Either one of you? Maria, don't be afraid to speak up. Sure, yeah. I'm uh, just. I don't know how um, how we'll break down this, but yeah, we basically distinguish between very slow and reasonable. So we see a lot of people trying to optimize. If they get a score of I don't know 85, then they want to get to 87, and then someone else has 89. So on the PageSpeed uh, Insights tool, so th that kind of distinction is maybe a little bit going too granular. If you are like not really really slow, like if your site is loading reasonably fast, then we're we're good with that. Um, so if you are shaving off like a millisecond here and a millisecond there, that might be time better spent in a different place. But having a reasonable fast loading site might make users more eager to browse, so you, you actually get them to do more stuff on your site. So from a user perspective, even a small change might uh, have a, an effect, but it's not going to have an effect on, you know, 100 milliseconds more means, you know, one position higher or something like this. So if, right. if you do tests and you think about it from the user point of view, speed up whatever you can for them. Uh, but for us, we basically distinguish between a decent site and a reason like a, a slow site. Right. So if you're getting red scores in page speed insights, and I'm not saying that's your trigger, but just something that's so bad that it uh, uh, it's shown as really slow, then you could have a problem and and suffer some some impact. Um, right. Yeah, and, and again, is page speed insights we've built it so that it's easier for the technical part of the team on a specific site to be able to see what is happening and what they need to change. Right. But a very easy way to test is just to switch off Wi-Fi and on 3G or whatever network you have available, just try to load the site and see what happens. Uh, and then you'll get a pretty good idea of are you 
willing to wait that extra two seconds or three seconds, or are you, is it is it good enough? So that's a, a decent, just common sense test. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Um, so um, let, let's actually switch gears a little bit and talk some about apps. Um, uh, and one of the things uh, that struck me is I looked at ComScore data, which was like from last August or something like that. And at the time, uh, it, I recall it saying that 44% of all digital media time spent by people is spent in a smartphone app. And that was a sort of a fall out of my chair moment uh, to realize, of course, that includes things like Netflix or, or you know, Kindle apps or you know, book apps, things like that, um, uh, as part of that time spent on YouTube, uh, where you know they they can be great time sinks. But that seems to say to me that if you're in the market uh, to reach customers, which most businesses are. Um, uh, you know, your audience is probably spending some of their time in apps somewhere, and maybe you ought to try to reach them. Um, and uh, so, having said that, uh, uh, one of the things that I think this is Google data, I forget exactly what it was, but so, something like uh, a quarter of all installed apps never get used, and 36% uh, of the apps, if I'm remembering the numbers right, get, get used daily. And that kind of leads us to the, the power of uh, deep linking, uh, what you now call Firebase app indexing. Did I get that right? Yes. Um, uh, so there, I got the name right. That's good. Um, uh, and can you just talk a little bit about why Firebase app indexing is so important? Sure. Yeah, I, I just want to pre preface this with a, with a caveat that uh, it's not something that is should be a part of a strategy for everyone. Um, its apps are usually fairly high threshold in terms of people finding them and installing them. So you probably, if you have a cohort of very loyal customers that you see coming back again and again, those would be a very good part of um, your audience to target with an app because they are already engaged and you can engage them even more. Um, if you think about apps and compare it to websites, it's you basically would have to download an entire website just to see one page. So that's how it works with apps right now. And we want to change that. We want to make the information within apps as accessible and useful as um, the information from websites. Ultimately, our goal would be for people not to have to even think about where this information is stored. So that's the benefit that we see for the users. And for content owners or business owners, uh, the benefit is that we send people back to your app um, again and again from search. We see that a lot of people install apps and then forget about them, so this is a good way to get them to go back to the app. And also, there's a, um, a slight ranking advantage for these apps, even if they're not installed, when people are searching uh, for them. So they might show a little bit higher and have a higher chance of getting installed. So we are um, looking for ways and different technologies. Some of the stuff that we announced at I.O., um, like instant apps and um, game streaming and so forth, to make the content from apps available. And the benefit for business owners is that they might get more users. But again, this is not something that you should be looking to engage completely new people that have never heard of your brand or your business before. It's extremely unlikely that someone who'd never heard of a business will go ahead and just download a whole app from that business. So if you have your strategy smart, then it can be a great thing. Uh, but then going and building an app and getting it indexed so that you could get a slight ranking boost is too much effort for the return <laughs> that you're going to oh, get. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. But but it's, really, it's, it's important in terms of getting the information to be accessible. That's why we think it's very important. Right. No, absolutely. And, and so there's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's uh, three methods that people can use to, to pursue app indexing. Uh, um, uh, it, well, in terms of uh, uh, exposing the, the URIs, 
the MetaTag method, the API method, and the sitemap method? Um, so about? we're trying to make this very as simple as possible. So based on feedback from people, the thing that we are recommending right now and the thing that works the easiest is just to use the API and then connect your site and your app. And then there's much fewer changes to be made on the website side. Because one thing that we discovered um, is that actually the biggest problem is not that the implementation on the website side is difficult or the implementation on the app side is difficult, but it's the fact that people have to talk to each other. <laughs> um, so the web team and the app team normally are separate. And uh, requiring them to collaborate made this process a lot more cumbersome. So we've tried to shave off um, as much of that as possible. And they still have to interact. So you know, if you have an app developer in your company, invite them to lunch. Uh, but you just have to make sure that your app supports uh, HTTP URLs. So that means that the content is addressable and accessible, same like web pages. And then you need to connect your app in your site. And that you can do either from Search Console or from the Play Console. So either the webmaster or the app developer can do this. And then after that, we just go to town indexing and crawling and rendering content. So that's as, as simple as we've made it at this stage. Right. So the, when you use the API, um, the app developers, for the most part, able to work on their own. Not entirely, but for the most part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're, we're trying to make this as simple, as, as tr streamlined as possible. And then the API also helps um, send us information about how people are engaging with this app. And if we see that it's really popular and there's good engagement, we do provide like an additional ranking boost for those apps um, so that they can show up even higher. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about Now on Tap and, and what that is? Um, so Now on Tap is a really fun technology um, that I use a lot on uh, my device. It, it lets you get into useful apps uh, or search results straight from another app, so you don't have to change context. Um, it Basically, when you are within a specific app, you can just press the home button. This is for Android devices. And we'll scan the contents of the screen, and based on what type of content you have indexed from apps or in search, uh, we'll offer some suggestions. So this is useful to look up things like movies or restaurants. Um, that's how I use it most frequently, usually. And for app owners, it basically means that people don't even have to search to get to your app. They can be in a different app and move seamlessly to your app. Um, so it, the functions of it are expanding, and uh, we, we are working to make it even more useful with more content. So it's an, it's an interesting um, added benefit. Like I wouldn't say it's the main benefit of app indexing, but it's an interesting added benefit. Right. So if you do the right things with your your uh, app uh, implementation, your app indexing implementation, then your app becomes eligible in the right context for participation. Yeah. Uh, in now on tap, and that's uh, the example I saw. I saw. I think it was Bashad uh, Bazadi who did a demo, and uh, he had been searching for information about a restaurant, uh, and then he said, you know, "Book me a table at 7 p.m." And it opened up the Open Table app, uh, and actually went through the process of booking it. So it made it really seamless from a user perspective. Uh, so you're know, almost crossing between web and apps, like uh, uh, you know, it's a sort of one environment. So yeah, and with with things like instant apps and app streaming uh, from search results, we're trying to find ways to make apps even not installed apps, content from them accessible to users. So right. stay tuned. But there, we have multiple efforts uh, going on in making app content more accessible to people. Awesome. All right, so if we get some time to cover uh, AMP. Let's talk about AMP. I think that's John's cue. Um, so um, can you just give a little basic overview of how it works to start, uh, John, and then we'll dive into deeper questions? OK, sure. So basically, AMP is a, almost like a simplified version of HTML, where the, the, what, what you do in practice is you take your desktop site or your mobile site, and you create an AMP version of those URLs. And you link those two pages like you would with a separate mobile URL, for example. 
So basically, you have a desktop site or your mobile site and your AMP pages, and you link between them so that we know for this, this specific mobile page, we have this AMP page. And within AMP, Essentially, the, the kind of simplifications that are there, the, the JavaScript that's in there is, is made so that it almost renders instantly. So what we can do in search, then, is kind of provide those AMP pages in, in the news carousel, which we have there at the moment. You can click on those, and almost within probably less than a second, you can get to that content directly. And uh, one of the, I guess, the neat things around AMP that we did there, or that was done in general, is that this is an open platform. It's open source. Anyone can, can kind of work on that to, to add more functionality. And it supports essentially everything that, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe not everything, but the, the primary things that most publishers need, which includes things like analytics, uh, various types of analytics you can do there, ads, monetization, to, to kind of make sure that you actually get something out of that. Right. So part of the, the gain is that uh, the page ends up being a lot more lightweight in terms of total size, page size. Uh, another part of the gain is that the content is largely pre-rendered. So you don't have a lot of back and forth with web servers taking place. Yeah. And then the final benefit is the caching infrastructure uh, that, that gets leveraged so that uh, uh, people are retrieving their data locally. Just to share some data from our tests here, uh, we implemented AMP pay, uh, versions of our uh, um, uh, blog pages, uh, reduced page size by 71%. Uh, took us from a page speed insight score of 42 to 88. Uh, so from in the red with that 42 to a nice solid green at 88. So that was kind of cool. Um, and uh, yeah, so pretty pretty dramatic speed up. Enough so that uh, Gary, and I have to say his last name because he hates it when I do that, but so Gary Eish uh, said, uh, when asked what the top two uh, or top recommendations he had uh, for people at, uh, in his keynote at SMS Advance, one of the things he cited was, go, you know, AMP. You got to, AMP is going to be big, he said. Yes. So I, well, I mean, what I really like about it is that it's, it's almost a chance to rethink a lot of the, the things that we've kind of organically developed to around the web, where we can say, well, this doesn't really work that well, or this slows the pages down, or this is problematic because, like for instance, analytics, it's something, well, different parts within your organization want different kind of trackers, so people just end up adding seven or eight or 10 trackers to any specific page. And with AMP, you just have one tracker that essentially pings all of those others separately. So it's a chance to kind of rethink where the web is now and what it would be if we could simplify things completely and kind of start with uh, something much smaller and lightweight. Right. Well, and we go back to the conversation we had earlier, which is, well, gee, maybe you should start thinking about your mobile side of things first. Well, I mean, here, here we are. Here's AMP, right, being a uh, mobile-centric uh, way of thinking. Um, uh, and you know that, that page speed uh, matters in the desktop world too. Uh, uh, maybe it's a little more better better adapted to dealing with uh, more complicated communications, but it does still matter uh, quite a bit. So, um, so what are the kinds of things that you typically can't do in an AMP page that you uh, uh, that people will miss potentially, like forms, for example? Forms are coming. So Excellent. You can't. <laughs> so um, I, I think, in, in general, AMP pages, are, since they're served over a cache, a CDN, it's a lot harder to make them dynamic. So if you have something that changes like completely from day to day, then that's something that's a lot harder to do with AMP. You can still use iframes for a lot of that, but it's it gets complicated. So for static content, it's, it's really extremely well suited. If it's something like an article that you have that you want to present, that you have on a new site, on a blog, it's, it's perfect for that. Any kind of informational static content, that works really well. But uh, the other things, they, they're coming step by step. So some of those you can do with iframes already. Um, things like forms are already on the roadmap 
they have a public roadmap for this. It's a, it's a GitHub project. You can see what's happening, what people are working on. So it's, it's kind of a little bit different from Google search in the sense that it's just all open. It's, uh, it's open source. It's something where you can see what's happening, where things are going. Yeah, no, that's cool. I mean, there are other people like uh, Pinterest and Twitter and WordPress, for example, are all involved in doing stuff with this. So one of the important distinctions about AMP is it's it's really an open open source uh, initiative with other participants. It's I mean, Google is obviously playing a very large role in it, but um, uh, but it is a, a broad uh, industry initiative. So in terms of using iframes to do things that you can't currently do in AMP. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, and that's sort of your uh, way to create a carve out on the screen where the rest of the page will load instantly, and then if you have something that you have to have going on, it takes place inside the iframe. Um, what, are there things that you don't suggest using iframes to solve? Um, it's it's hard to say. I, I guess from, from a search point of view, we, we would probably pretty much take anything that's valid AMP. But for a valid AMP, I believe there, there are limitations on the size of the iframe and the location of the iframe. So it has to be, to some extent, like below the fold, because it's, it's loading asynchronously. It's loading later. So if it's primary content that you want to show to people, then you probably want to keep it in that cached part of the page. But uh, there. There are some really nice, nice experiments that, that various publishers have done with iframes, with AMP. So it's, it's definitely worth looking at. One thing I recommend in general is if you're working with clients with different, uh, different companies, then this is a technology that's not going to go away anytime soon. So it's really worth taking the time to figure out how this works and what you might need to do to support this in the future. So for example, for iframes, since these pages are cached on HTTPS, the iframe content also has to be on HTTPS. So if you haven't moved to HTTPS, then that's something you'd probably want to do, especially if you want to put something in iframes later on. Yeah, so that's a good point of emphasis, which is that you need to, you need to be on HTTPS. Right. And then, um, so uh, is, are we still at the point where only certain sites get shown AMP pages in the results? Is that still the status? Um, it's not whitelisted. It's not that there's there's a manual list at Google which sites get AMP and which ones don't. But we show it in the in the news section on top of the page, or depending on the search results, I guess. Uh, usually within like a carousel, sometimes just a, as normal links in, within the, in the news section as well if we don't have that much content. What, what is kind of different is we don't show this in all countries at the moment because newsworthy content depends a lot on the local news. You can't just show news from the US to people in India because they kind of expect their local versions as well. So in order for us to show this kind of AMP content, we need to make sure that there's actually enough content that we could show there. So it's it's kind of, if you're in one of those countries where we don't show AMP yet, then by implementing AMP for your site, you're kind of encouraging us to kind of jump in and say, OK, we, we have great content to show within AMP now. It makes sense for us to open that up there, too. So does it only show up when it's in, uh, when you have enough results that you can display a carousel? Is that what you're uh, saying? Or? Uh, we, we show either the carousel or the individual links. So I don't think there's like a, a number of results limit, but yeah. uh, especially for the individual links, those those are just individual links. It's not that we need like 10 of those to show. Right. Um, this is also something that I see kind of moving further through the search results for different types of content, not just news content, where the AMP team might say, I believe we said something like around recipes at Google I.O., for example, yeah. um, where that's like different parts of the search results where we think static content currently plays a big role and where it's important for us to say we can provide something really fast for the user. And by providing something fast for the user, they're willing to engage more with that within your website, read more, and kind of just generally be able to process this information faster. I'll, I'll let you know when the Stone Temple Consulting blogs uh, start uh, rendering uh, AMP pages. How about that? <laughs> uh, 
All right. Hey, Mark, are you ready to uh, drive the Q&A here? Absolutely. We've got a lot of good questions. Awesome. Let's All go. Right. Hey guys, these are questions that are registered users for the virtual keynote submitted to us in advance. And just want to remind folks who are watching, we do these on a, uh, we'll be doing these on a fairly regular basis. Be watching for them from all of our social media feeds. And if you register in advance and get on our mailing list, uh, then you can submit a question that will potentially be asked here. We got a lot of great questions. I'm going to focus mostly on the mobile questions. We have a lot of general SEO types of questions, but. Uh, since we can keep up the subject matter here in the time that we have. Uh, but I am going to sneak in one kind of more general question, because this, I think it's fun. This is from Andy Simpson. And uh, Andy asked, when, John, when do you think we're going to be hit by SSL Mageddon? <laughs> and I, I know you must oh. love that name as much as <laughs> Gary Ish loves Mobilegeddon. Um, let's put the question oh. more positively. Is uh, having a secure site going to become... A, a major ranking factor, and so when? Actually, we're, we're way past SSL because SSL is essentially the last generation that of the secure protocol that was used for HTTPS. TLS. And I think we switched to TLS like it's five, six, seven years. Ago. I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, SSL is essentially obsolete. So no SSL getting done. <laughs> But we can go to TLS get and there you go. <laughs> I, no, no, no. Stop. <laughs> but is but, but go I ahead. think HTTPS is something that's not going to go away. It's it's not it's not a fad. It's not something where people will say, oh, Google cares about this today, but next week Google will care about rich snippets. It's something that essentially needs to be a part of the the web by default in the long. So the, the earlier you move, the, the faster you have it behind you, and you can kind of move on. So that's something where I see, for example, with AMP, if you have embedded videos or iframe content, you need to have HTTPS anyway. You need to have done that. If you want to set up a progressive web app where you have a service worker that creates kind of like an offline version of your website that works on your phone, then you need to have HTTPS. A lot of these technologies, they essentially require HTTPS to, to work, and it makes sense that they require that. So the earlier you can move to HTTPS, um, the faster you have it kind of behind you. And I imagine a lot of sites, when they start off nowadays, if you start off with HTTPS, the initial cost will be like a minimal amount more than just by starting off without HTTPS. So especially if you're setting up a new site, just do it from the start. So people should be thinking about it from, in terms of uh, it's the right thing to do for their users, it's the right thing to do for some of the things they'll be able to offer, not so much as a ranking factor in Google. Yeah, if you do it for their ranking, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. And given how many other signals and factors we have, um, it, you probably like will be waiting for a long time to see yourself jumping up <laughs> in the results. Uh, because you have HTTPS, but the trust that you're going to get from your users is more important, and the fact that more and more new technologies require this is is also something that means that even if you want to implement something in the future, you might be blocked because you don't have that, and then you have to do it in a rush. Yeah, I can tell you we did a, a, a test a while back, and we found essentially uh, um, no discernible uh, ranking benefit. This was immediately after so announced that it was one, but the way Gary described it to me is, oh, you treat it like a, a tiebreaker in a very close uh, ranking situation, and I made the analogy of being like the vice president's vote in the U.S. Senate in case there's a tie there. It's, you know, come up like three times in U.S. history. Um, I, I'm not meaning to diminish it, but just to step back where you could see where it might become more significant of a ranking factor, and I'm not speaking on behalf of Google, I'm just speaking on behalf of myself, is if nearly everybody has converted to HTTPS and you're the one who hasn't yet, then it might be more noticeable to users and be worth putting more weight on. But right now, it's not something that's going to be a big ranking factor just because 
um, uh, you know. But it's, uh, it's it's also something that that's coming from multiple sides. So right. I, I've seen browser browser companies say, well, we're going to flag all HTTP content as potentially insecure because nobody knows what has happened to this content from the time it left the server to when it reaches your browser. You, you don't know. It, it could have been modified. There could be tracking elements added to it. People could be injecting ads. It could have malware injected. Obviously, a lot of this is something that really rarely happens, but uh, when you go to, to places that have public Wi-Fi in, in airports, for example, it's really common that you suddenly have some weird tracking element attached to a page or some ads that are injected in a weird way. And that's something where if you care about your website and how it comes to users, you kind of need to watch out for that. Well, if you ever want a demonstration, just go to a hotel and sign up for and, and try to go to a web page. And uh, that's an example of what you can do. You can't guarantee that the content you as the publisher have published is what the user is going to receive uh, without it. So, and, and another thing, probably worth mentioning, if you have a blog, for example, if you're creating your content while you're out, while you're at the airport or at a cafe with a public Wi-Fi, and you don't have HTTPS, then you're essentially sending your password for your for your whole setup uh, in the clear. So anyone who might be monitoring that might have access to your blog's username and password. Doesn't sound good. Good tips. I thought that was going to be a two-minute one, and it was like a five-minute one, but there was a lot there of good stuff in there. Appreciate hey, that's it. That's an exciting going. All right, let's jump back to AMP. Uh, a lot of people asked us about the expansion of AMP to other types of sites, and I know you already alluded to that a little bit, but can you give us any more insight or detail on that? You know, if I have an e-commerce site or something like that with content on it, is it worth me spending a time to get involved in implementing AMP? Is it going to benefit me? Eventually, you know, how soon will it be rolling out to other sites aside from sites that get into Google News? So it's not limited to Google News. I, I think that's maybe up front. It's the the in the news section can be any type of content that's newsworthy, which means you don't need to think about the type of site, but the type of content that you have. So if an e-commerce site, maybe you still have news articles that you're putting out on your blog, or you have general blog posts that are happening, and those blog posts could be put out in a way that's compatible with AMP. So you install the WordPress plugin, and you essentially just have to tweak the template, and you're done. Uh, and suddenly, all of the stuff you put on your blog is available in an AMP format and could be shown in search like that, too. So it's not so much the type of site, but more the type of content. Uh, with regards to other types of content, that's something where I know the AMP team is working extremely fast. They're, I think, one of the most efficient teams at Google, at least uh, the, the people that are at Google that are working on this. So that's something where I really expect that to kind of flood out into various parts of, of the search results fairly quickly. Right, thank you. Uh, Felix Sofiwe of Blinds.com wants to know, if we look out a year from now, how different, much different do you think the mobile SEO landscape will be? What, what changes do you see coming down the pike, say, about a year from now? The very interesting question, I think, uh, what we see is very different from, uh, based on the size and the how in touch people are uh, with what is happening. So I would really hope that a year from now, a much larger chunk of small business websites and, and other websites of uh, like educational institutions and stuff like that will actually have a, a mobile-friendly version. Uh, so the, the lag that we see between what is happening from the user side and what we announce and then what is happening in terms of the adoption within the community is, is definitely uh, significant. So hopefully, <laughs> and maybe whoever asked this question can help with that if, if that's what they're working on, um, more, more of these sites will actually be mobile friendly because we see a lot of people just kind of missing out on this whole thing. Um, and then in terms of what's going to happen at the avant-garde or like cutting edge, I, I think there's a lot of interesting things happening in, uh, with 
voice queries with all these assistants that are popping up. So those would be new and interesting surfaces that we'll engage people on. And there's a lot more in terms of videos and images. So balancing speed with rich content is also another very interesting topic uh, for us. Um, and then also personalized and hyper-local content. So these kind of things, I think, will continue to happen. Uh, but the main thing for us is that sort of everybody gets uh, to hear about the importance of mobile, because there's still a lot of people out there that are way out, in, like just have a desktop site that they haven't touched since 2004. And uh, we, we would really hope that those people will, will get on board by, by next year this time. Great. So, yeah. I would offer one, one thought, too, is just go back to what we um, uh, talked about earlier. Um, design for that thing first. <laughs> right? I, I mean, you, you see it with uh, the, the people when, when they're out, out and about, they're, they're on their phones. They're doing something on their phone. They're using it for, for everyday activities. Even when I have my laptop in front of me, I'll pull out my phone and do something on my phone directly just because it's, it's more convenient. It's easier to do voice queries. I, th I think this trend of people doing more and more on their phone and expecting it to work and getting frustrated if it doesn't work, that's, that's going to keep, keep happening. And another thing that I suspect might might happen if I put like a futurologist's hat on, is that uh, a lot of the people in in some of the emerging markets they're essentially growing up without a desktop. They're using the internet from the start with their phone. They're they're maybe using a laptop or desktop in the office for a couple of hours, but the rest of the day they're spending on their phone. And the the way things are growing there, I definitely see some things that were designed for mobile there, kind of swap over to, to the Western world, or I don't know what you would call it. <laughs> but uh, that's something where I, I really expect some really interesting exchanges to happen just with regards to mobile, but with regards to online culture in general. Well, you have to understand, that it, there's going to be a bit of a journey here, right? Nobody has the perfect answer for what the perfect mobile experience is. We're, we're dealing with data points like the one uh, Maria sir, uh, shared earlier, which is 30 times as likely to get an action-oriented query by voice. And you know, I suggested some of that might be selection bias, but I don't think there's any doubt that the behavior of the person with a different uh, keyboard and a different screen size and a voice interface is going to be somewhat different. Um, and so that can be a little bit scary for people to jump into. But, I mean, for me, I'm always a glass, I'll call that half full. I think that's being optimistic for sure. Um, uh, the unknown is opportunity. That's where you get a chance to get ahead of other people. So you've got to dive in and take advantage of this opportunity that's lying in front of us because we have a major disruptive change which is in process right now. This is where people win and lose. So that's my, uh, can I get off the soapbox now? <laughs> Yeah, I'm back then. Right, I just want to note that I'm a I'm a can half full person. I, I guarantee you. I'm glad you say a can't half full. But. I'm really taken by faith that that's half full because I can't see. So uh, you you both mentioned uh, John and Maria in your uh, your last comments. You both touched on voice search uh, and the effect of voice. And uh, let me see who this is here. Um, oh, there it is. Vince Pimentel of GT Nexus wants to know how is conversational voice search going to affect how long string searches appear in Google Analytics and or Search Console? So the effect of, of long, search, long string search queries from conversational search. Any, any particular effect you see there? So for, for analytics, I can't speak to what they're um, planning to do with this kind of stuff uh, in Search Console. We have uh, very close relations with uh, with the engineering product teams there, and they're looking into potentially might might it make sense to have this um, distinguished in the search analytics report in Search Console so people can split those out. Uh, but there are so many different elements in the search results page. We are way way 
beyond the 10 blue links. So it's, it's always a matter of prioritization. Like, do you show this or do you show that? Um, last week, we had the rich cards um, as their own element in search analytics. And there's more coming. But basically, what we're, we're looking at is what type of elements to show. So what you might see within the next year is that you'll be able to split by voice queries uh, in Search Console. And Very cool. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's competing with, with a bunch of other priorities, obviously. So we, we can't really promise anything here. But um, it is one of the things that is being looked at. So. That was a nice little, uh, little scoop there. Somebody out there on Twitter should be tweeting that out under the hashtag virtual keynote. Uh, so that, so uh, I guess w one of the things there to, to keep in mind is we try to make this information so that it's actually actionable for you, so that it gives you something that tells you a bit about what's happening, but also gives you an opportunity to say, OK, if I work more on my site in this regard, then this metric will improve. And that's something where voice queries are sometimes kind of tricky because it's it's almost kind of kind of at the phase now where it's it's interesting to look at, but you don't really know what how to respond to that as a webmaster, because for a large part we can essentially do search results normally. You don't need to do SEO for voice queries. We can understand what people are talking about and try to bring the same type of results in. So if you have specific use cases where you say, well, if I had this split out in Search Console, then I could make this amazing thing that Google would be proud to show in the search results, then that's kind of the, the information that would be really useful for us, because we can go to a product team and say, well, look at this thing that people are willing to do with this information if only they had it. Right. Of course, this gets back to what I was saying before. This is going to be a bit of a journey, and part of it is that, like learning. You need raw data to learn, and then you're going to find out what the meaning is in it at some point, right? Uh, we, we don't know the direction, really, the voice queries are going to take us in the long run. Um, it's going to take us somewhere. So, but, you know, maybe, maybe not an SEO-specific thing that people need to do, but certainly a, a UI design thing that they might learn from. That makes a nice uh, segue to a question from Laura Crest here, not about voice search, but uh, something that probably a lot of uh, maybe beginning webmasters or beginning SEOs might wonder about. Uh, is there a significant difference between SEO best practices for mobile versus desktop? Or should, should you be thinking about SEO differently from mobile versus desktop? Not that I can think of. I'm. I mean, it's it's something where, at some point, what will probably happen is that most people go to your mobile site, and maybe you should think about which one is actually my main site. It's like maybe the desktop is almost your alternate site. But uh, when, when it comes there, obviously, we need to make sure that we can actually crawl a mobile site and pick up the links internally as well. But otherwise, it's I mean, even that is kind of the same as with a desktop site. Like, there are links, there's content, there's a semantic structure. Yeah, wh whatever helps your mobile site will definitely be beneficial for your desktop site. So nobody ever complained that uh, a site is too fast or that there's it's very clear where you're supposed to click or that there's exactly the amount of information that they need. Um, so definitely, if you make your mobile website work, um, that will, the, the benefits will ripple out to, to your desktop version. And again, based on user studies or query information or how, however else you're, you're keeping track of what your clients and users are doing on your site, you might start questioning, OK, what, what is the functionality that I can't by any means have on my mobile site? Like, What is this distinguishing thing that keeps the desktop version still there? Right. One, one thing, of course, is uh, if you have a mobile subdomain, you do, do need switchboard tags, right, so that Google can parse the pages. And that's one very specific technical difference. But yeah. A couple of people asked about uh, a separate ranking index for mobile versus uh, desktop. Uh, is that still coming? Uh, if so, you know, how far off is that? 
I guess we're still experimenting with those kind of things. So I, I don't have anything specific to kind of announce there. That's something where kind of as we see more and more people going to a mobile site, maybe it makes sense to treat that more, more like a desktop site. But that's something where I, I would say that's, that's still kind of in the future, where we're looking at various things, doing some experiments, but it's, it's not easy. Right, so tomorrow at 3.42 p.m., is that what I heard? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we just... Somebody tweet that out. No, no, don't, don't tweet that. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the, these are things where, where you're looking at kind of the long-term development, and that's something where wh when you make plans for, for a company like Google around search, you need to think about, on the one hand, where, where could we be in, in one year, but also where is like the web headed in the next five or 10 years, and what do we need to do to make that incremental change in that direction? And those discussions are not, not that easy. No one has a crystal ball and says, well, this is going to happen. Therefore, we need to take these 10 steps over the next couple of months to actually get there. OK. Um, Avinash Kanda of Shutterfly asks, how different are the rankings from device to device? He says, we are currently seeing different rankings on different browsers as well. How big is this difference? So is there actually a difference in rankings between devices? I'm not aware of it. I've never I'm heard of that. Yeah. yeah. I, I could imagine maybe for, for apps you, you would see some differences. I don't know for sure. Maria would probably know. Not yes, uh, there, it's to the extent that some things are available in, let's say, Android and not available in iOS, so they would simply not trigger. But that makes sense. I, I'm not aware of any, like, you're using this phone or you're using, I don't know, that browser, so we'll show you. You're not, you're not serving up uh, search results specifically geared toward different devices, other than those features that might not show. Yeah, I mean, w one thing that might be happening, depending on what what they're looking at, is that maybe they're looking at different versions of the search results. So maybe we can recognize that this specific feature only works in modern browsers, and you're currently using an older browser, and we show you kind of a simplified version of the search results page that doesn't show that feature. But it's not that we like shift the rankings around. It's more that, well, this specific component of the search results doesn't actually work in your browser. We won't show it to you then. So that might be happening. I guess the other thing is just the general, we do a lot of experiments, and you might be looking at different data centers, different kind of paths, personalization comes into play. But I don't really know of anything where we'd say, oh, you have and Nexus 5, and you have a Nexus 6, therefore we will show you different results. I don't see that making sense. Hmm. I think it's a good general point that you just mentioned testing, and we're hearing about that a lot more in, in Google presentations that we're you know, hearing where this all this testing going on all the time from select groups of users at any given time that you might be in a particular test. So people, when they see something odd in the search results, they shouldn't run right out and say, like, oh my gosh, Google's changed this. But you know, take some time, see if that result lasts. Are other people getting it? Are other people in other parts of the world getting it? You know, it's good to just ask around and, and see uh, what's happening before you, you run off, right? It'll, it'll save, save you two a lot of time. In this uh, I, I mean, we do a lot of tests. But it's not that we're doing these tests to kind of bug the SEOs and kind of make them all freak out. I, I think this is something that play with us? should be doing. It's yeah. something where. Even if you think you have the perfect website, you should constantly be testing that and kind of checking your assumptions and making sure that what you're providing actually works well for your users and that you're actually doing the best possible for your users. And that's something where you sometimes have to go back and say, well, I always thought this was what everyone wanted to see, but maybe I should double check to see if that's really the case. Yeah, we actually launched a really cool program very recently um, in the US and a few other countries for developers. So it's device labs. And you can get access to a bunch of different devices um, and limit different things like speeds of and types of network that this device is on. And you can test your it's for it's for apps, but you can also do the same principle for testing your site. And that that is always really helpful because 
if you are seeing your device on your uh, or your site on an iPhone 6 Plus with like a huge screen on LTE, it might be a very different experience for someone with a smaller screen on 2G. So if you have that kind of audience, then it's it's great to test that too. Okay. Eric, do we have time for one more? Or how are we doing? Uh, yeah, if you got a quick one, if, if John and Maria are willing to take one last one. Okay. Go for it. Let's see if we can make this one quick. This is from Tyler Hermanson, and he says, are there any hard and fast rules in striking a balance between content consistency and UX concerns with multiple device views? So in the world where there's multiple devices, you know, you've got UX concerns, right? You've got content delivery concerns. How do you strike a balance in there? Very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the only I, answer that can be given. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I would. I would suggest thinking about um, progressive enhancement and graceful degradation here. So, if you if you have something that works on the worst possible situation, then you can progressively enhance from there and give more and more to people who have devices with more capabilities. And then the other way around, if you have something that's really fancy. Think about how it can, how you can do graceful degradation for that, for slower speeds and, and older devices. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, I think maybe we should call it a wrap. Uh, uh, John, Maria, thank you so much. I think it was great to have both of you on. Uh, fun conversation. Uh, sometime when you have four hours available, we can go a little deeper. Um, uh, well, you could talk about this stuff forever, honestly. Uh, so many things that we didn't get to that I would have loved to. But, uh, yeah, thanks for the questions. It's been really uh, interesting to hear what people want to know. Uh, yeah, our, our pleasure. And, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to get you back on uh, sometime in the future uh, for some future event. Um, thanks to all of you who are watching. Uh, and uh, Mark, as always, thank you for the fabulous job. Um, and uh, uh, that, so that's it for today's uh, virtual keynote. And thank you all. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone.